Marshall here. Welcome back to The Realignment. Everyone, welcome back to the show. This is the last week of this current season, so we will have a full slate of episodes, but we will be taking next week off. All that said, but a great episode today. I'm speaking with Matthew Ball. He's the author of The Metaverse and How It Will Revolutionize Everything. Folks have probably heard about this term metaverse in a bunch of different places. So this is a great episode for understanding what the concept is, why it matters, and why the debate over the future of the internet is just getting started. Hope you guys enjoy this episode and check out our Supercast, our Substack, the bookshop where you purchase Matthew's book, all other good parts. Hope you enjoy this episode. Matthew Ball, welcome to The Realignment. Good to be here. I'll start with a quick anecdote that relates to you and your work that will speak to, I think, a bit of the skepticism that some of the audience may have. So after Mark Zuckerberg announced the changing of Facebook's broader company name to Meta, I got a text message from a Hill staffer who works for a prominent uh, senator, and they sent me one of your articles, and they said, quote, look at this bullshit. These tech shills are already trying to shoehorn in Mark Zuckerberg's fake pivot. Basically, the idea being this metaverse idea is this brand new thing. It's kind of vague. Zuckerberg's desperate and trying to change the story. So they made it all about whatever Mark Zuckerberg is doing with this metaverse concept. So can you just like respond to that just like very direct point that this is, and I'm clearly putting my editorial POV here, this is a much deeper story than whatever Mark Zuckerberg does or doesn't do in the space. Sure, I'd be happy to. History is helpful here. The term metaverse is, of course, 30 years old, comes from Snow Crash in 1992. The ideas span nearly a century back. 1935, we have the first science fiction expressions of virtual reality. In the 1950s, Philip K. Dick, Isaac Asimov, others who we know were pretty good at predicting elements of the future, start to describe holography, 3D communications, the idea that a pastime would be creating and inhabiting virtual worlds. What is new is that we start to have the technologies required to actually pull off this otherwise fantastical idea. But more important is actually tracing back the investments. The most significant companies today in the metaverse, those which seem best positioned, are actually those that have spent the past 30 years working quietly and slowly towards this idea, often using the term metaverse, but to little acclaim. That includes Epic Games, which of course has sued the most valuable company on the planet, arguing that they have outlawed it. NVIDIA, a company that is known to very few, but is now one of the seven largest companies on earth, founded in 1993. These are the successes that we should really be lauding. Roblox, another 2004, releases in 2006, unknown to essentially everyone until 2018, and today is one of the most popular experiences on Earth. There is a sadness in the fact that the metaverse has become so entangled with a specific vision and of a company that is so controversial, and to a lesser extent, the crypto movement at large. Because irrespective of the individual advocate, the individual product, technologies which may or may not be part of it, the metaverse is coming. It is extraordinarily important. It has been coming for decades. And we are now at the point in time in which we should be thinking about it. Certainly the world's largest companies are. And it's hard to do this perfectly succinctly because you have a whole chapter on defining the metaverse, but you set forth just three useful ways from a layperson's perspective of thinking about what the metaverse actually is. So I'll list out all three and we'd love for you to dive into each of them individually. So the first one would be the fourth era of computing. Second would be a parallel plane of existence. And then the third would be just a general observation about how we are going to live and work in the future. So can you explain all three? Sure. So we generally assess there as having been three primary eras in computing and networking. The first was mainframes in the 1950s through the 1970s. The second was the advent of the personal computer coincident with the rise of the internet protocol suite. It makes sense to intermingle the two. Why? Because the killer app for the personal computer was in fact the internet. And the internet, because of the potency of its network effects, drove many people to then get a personal computer. And as each side of that equation grew, the utility of each side of the equation grew. Over the past 15 years, we've been in the cloud and mobile era. 
When we take a look at those, we can see some consistent attributes. First and foremost, we often personify each wave in a simplified sense, right? What's the innovation of mobile? We say it's a pocket-sized computer that travels everywhere. You don't dial up to the internet, you're always on the internet. But the real innovation was a fundamental transformation in who accesses computing and networking resources, when, where, why, and how. That changed the world. In the metaverse, we're talking about that from real-time 3D simulations. Don't think of it like a game. The second thing is that those platform shifts ultimately affected nearly every person on Earth, every country, every sector. Each wave came faster than the one that came before and tended to be more valuable than the one before, while also leading to fundamental changes in business models, technologies, and the companies which led. This connects to one of the reasons why I would tell the anonymous staffer who sent you the article, the investments here are not sudden nor random, not just about the 30-year-old companies. McKinsey and company recently estimated that the big five tech companies will spend over 120 billion this year investing in the metaverse alongside private equity and venture capital. Even Facebook has been investing here for more than a decade. They tried to buy the world's largest gaming engine in 2015, bought Oculus for twice of what they spent on Instagram and only a year later, that's a decade ago. And of course we have leaked memoranda that show that they believe the metaverse was quote unquote, theirs to lose in 2018. And that's because the idea of the metaverse as a fourth wave of computing has long been known. When you take a look at Neil Stevenson, he has long been understood to be a sage in Silicon Valley. Jeff Bezos hired him as the first employee at Blue Origin, his private aerospace company. The founders of Google Earth have said they tried to hire him and they were inspired to create that product based on him. Much of the blockchain movement considers him a legend as well. And so understanding this as we're in the fourth wave, we've learned a lot about the past three waves, we usually underestimate it, it usually comes faster, and now everyone has absolute conviction what the next one is, and they're rushing aggressively. And what's interesting there is, have we ever had a single company, that being Meta, try to patent in a sense, a wave in this way. So think about the mainframe area you're talking about here, like that's a, you know, your big IBM era. What if, you know, that this would be the equivalent of IBM saying, we are now the person, we're changing their name to personal computer. doesn't quite roll off the tongue as much, but that's there. Maybe this is a, a different version of Netscape, but Netscape could have called itself the internet. Have we ever seen someone try to do something like this before? No, it's a little bit strange, uh, certainly. And typically we see the reverse, right? For most people, the PC was an IBM PC. And if it wasn't, you would think of it as Windows. Windows had 96% share nationally. It had nearly 100% share in enterprise. And in the United States, of course, 90% of teens have an iPhone, 75% of smartphone owners today that buy a new phone have an iPhone. 66% of Americans use an iPhone. And so we're very used to the functional version of a tech wave being genericized, Kleenex. Yep. The reverse order is strange. And I can understand why that's daunting, and I agree. I do think it is actually interesting to take a look at what Meta is doing in that their actual policy decisions, now policy decisions come and go, often a corporation is more open, collaborative, and forthcoming early to gain market share. And so anything can change. But Meta, despite the desire to use the term, is actually committing to openness in a way that is unique in the industry. For example, they're the only console in the Oculus or MetaQuest that uses open standards for rendering. That's a very technical term, but what's important is to recognize that every hardware experience relies on many different things and most choose to tightly control what the options are. Apple of course, is being attacked, I think, justly for doing that excessively and to crunch competition. Facebook is oddly on the exact reverse. They're often not building things that their competitors not just build, but require everyone to use. And instead, Meta is embracing third-party global consortium-based standards. So there's a weird duality there of the optics, which I agree are concerning, 
and actually the policy programs today. Yeah, and this is an important, seems technical, but also has deep philosophical implications, this debate over open versus closed <laughs> systems. <laughs> the key thing to think about here for listeners is you have a closed system, that's AOL in the 1990s. You have your AOL version of the internet. You can't just you know easily transition from AOL to a different browsing experience or specific AOL versions of sites. Does the fact that Facebook slash Meta is the fact that the company's pursuing this open standard signifying the company's weakened position? It's not as if Mark, if, so basically the question would be if Facebook was, let's say, at its 2011 high, and by that yeah. I mean narratively speaking, mm-hmm. companies always be doing well from a value perspective. Do you think Mark Zuckerberg would still not be trying to force all of us to use the Facebook version of the metaverse? So it's, it's a fascinating question, and I discuss this a little bit in my book, in that you can come up with multiple different theories for which the answer is usually a mix of the two. Mm. Let me start with Microsoft, a company that most people, in particular in D.C., no longer consider an aggressor. And I think that that's a, a just perspective. Brad Smith, the vice chairman, released a policy memorandum earlier in the year outlining 14 points about how they want to operate in the future. This is part of their metaverse position. And they talk about themselves being open, why they think openness needs to exist. They commit to a consistent approach to internal services as to external services. They commit to when they are going to require their own vertical integration solutions and when they're not. And that coincided with Brad Smith last year, also talking about the fact that they believe that Apple's control was unjust and to the detriment of society, or or at least market competition. And he's also said that Microsoft was on the wrong side of open. Now, we can fairly say that a Microsoft in a parallel universe that did not lose in mobile computing, that was as powerful as it was at its peak, or as powerful as Apple is today, might not have come to that perspective. We can't know for sure. The good news is we're starting to see the market at work right? Competitive pressures in success or failure lead to change in philosophy. We can similarly say that Mark Zuckerberg, more than anyone else, has faced the repercussions of not owning your own operating system. Apple has stymied their cloud gaming efforts, effectively prohibited on the iOS platform. Obviously, Facebook has been deeply affected to the tune of $10 billion in profits this year alone by Apple's privacy changes. And Facebook's creator program or UGC platform basically doesn't work when you have to pay 30% to Apple first, then 30% to Facebook. It leaves nothing for the individual. And so we could justly say that Mark understands and empathizes with those who are forced to proprietary standards because he now knows the deleterious effects of them. But we could just as easily say that's because he's forced on the bum side of that trade And given the alternative, he would feel differently. We don't know. But what we do know is that the internet and the corporations which ride today have inherited openness. The internet was built by public research institutions and government labs to share, to collaborate, not to sell a widget, not to collect data, and not to place an ad. And so we inherited fundamental interoperability. We believe that building the metaverse requires us to establish interoperability again, but for which most of the technologies do not yet exist. And so it is quite plausible that Mark does believe that to pull off this grand vision, which I take for certain he does believe in, it's not just a question of what I would like. It's actually a question of what is required for that to even happen. And I do think that he believes, and at least I believe, deep openness is required. Can you explain what interoperability means and probably just define it in like web two, Facebook, Twitter terms. That's probably the way that an audience member would probably experience this dynamic. Yeah, so it's great. We experience it constantly, but unknowingly. And that's why the concept is a little bit hard to grok and why we're not familiar with it at all. The internet is interoperable. You and I are speaking on different networks from different devices, perhaps on different operating systems. And in fact, to get the data from my device to your device, we have to sit across probably five different intermediary networks. 
they have to exchange information reliably, coherently, safely, and in extraordinary real time. In addition, they need consistent ways of not just exchanging information, but contextualizing it, right? Our different devices and experiences are sending video, not just ones and zeros generically displayed. Interoperability is what supports that. It's why we talk about the internet is internetworking. It's a network of autonomous networks, united in terms of what's delivered, but also the file formats and technologies. Email is one example. .com is another. JPEG, that allows for this unified experience. A non-interoperable internet is actually what most believed would happen. The protocol wars are something forgotten, but from the 1970s to 1990s, we believed that we would have multiple competing networking stacks. It was impossible to believe that Comcast and Telefonica and China Mobile and BBC would all be able to exchange information through the same email address. It was wild to think that you wouldn't have the IBM internet, the Comcast internet, and they would fight one another indefinitely. Ultimately, we had a common interoperable framework that was built. The metaverse will require the same, but it's also the reason why many are worried about the future. The internet was so extraordinarily positive it democratized information, it lowered the cost for many things globally. But we believe that a lot of that came from the fact it was pioneered around interoperability, around common standards that weren't owned by a corporation, that it was built constitutionally by those focused on collaboration and from government. The metaverse, however, to get to the start of this conversation, is not being built that way. It is being built for profit, to sell things, to collect information, not by DOD, but by Meta, by Epic, by Roblox. And that does give reason for concern. And this is where this gets interesting. To what degree, you're obviously talking about the history of the 80s and 90s when it came to government. I want to get into that a bit later. But to what degree is this interoperable internet? You know, I'm recording this on a Microsoft Surface. Almost certainly you're not recording this on a Microsoft Surface. I use Google Fiber. Like that's an illustration of how these are different systems. To what degree was the outcome of today organic versus on all these different points? Did there need to be thumbs on the scale to move it away from it? Because you talk about this in the book. One could say, look, we all have all these open systems that have won out. But once again, the iPhone is one of the most closed systems on earth. There's a whole set of lawsuits. So this goes to your point about Facebook and Epic Games. You can't even play Fortnite on the iPhone because of this issue. So that's a closed system that wins out. Closed systems aren't just AOL failing. So to what degree was that a process that basically happened? This is a great question. And I want to go back to the protocol wars, right? We had multiple different networking stacks. It's important to recognize that even though DARPA and DOD led the creation of the internet, as early as the early 90s, the US government, obviously we use a single term to refer to it, but it's multiple different institutions, organizations, and decision makers, didn't agree. The Department of Commerce was advocating for OSI, even within the US, which birds and was still at the time shepherding most of the internet protocol suite. Sorry, what's OSI? Oh, it was just, well, that's just it. We don't know because the internet won, but it was another protocol that was being proposed that the Department of Commerce and most of the EU was advocating for. And so what happened is this natural process of coalescing around a single open, unowned networking stack. And that was for the common good. We generally see that the utility that comes from network effects and interconnection and standardization that doesn't pay a tax to one party or a tithe or fee is such a strong economic truism that it wins out in the end. And the global economy is another expression. Of course, we open up more and more each year and we never really came together and said, let's have true standards, but we have them. English, USD, the metric system, the intermodal shipping container, of course, we have multiple standards. There's also the uh, Euro. There's also German and French. We don't have to coalesce around one set. And of course, there are still private standards, just like in the internet. We still have private networks and private protocols. You still have to pay Twilio if you want to talk to a landline phone. The internet protocol suite doesn't do that for you for free. We still have paywalls. 
But the internet, like the global economy, shifted to some form of openness of the exchange of interconnection and then layered on and supplemented with commerce as well as restrictions. I'm Canadian if my OUs haven't given it away. And of course, NAFTA has facilitated a lot of openness by autonomous states, but not without significant brokering. And so I believe, many believe, that the arc of the metaverse will be similar. We will tend towards interoperation, standardization, because the benefits of doing so have been proven in the internet and in the real world. But problems still remain as to who's going to shepherd them, why are they being designed, and how are they being designed. I finished my book incredibly hopeful for regulatory action. And that's partly because while many look at the last 15 years and are dissatisfied with the state of global regulation, something that is changing pretty rapidly, that's a relatively modern issue or recent issue. Through most of the 20th and 19th century, the US in particular was very strong in shaping to the collective benefit, telecommunications, rail, steel, energy. The internet came from DOD. And one thing that I love to point to that almost no one knows is the Internet Engineering Task Force, which is a working group of birds of feather that shepherds the internet protocol suite today, decades after the internet was developed. That was started by DOD. And DOD then handed it off, relinquishing control, knowing that the regulatory establishment of this framework and the ability for it to endure were separate. And so I believe in this arc, but exactly how it manifests is not yet certain. Yeah, because the key thing is this this book is not a in two to three years look into your Oculus, you know, Oculus glasses and expect to see this future. This is a longer term story. Something I'm curious about, you mentioned the you've mentioned the DOD a couple of times. Like listeners will almost sure for sure know that you know the internet developed um, you know, from a defense perspective first, comes out of like the you know, nuclear war, 1960s. Like, is, is there any is there any aspect to this current story? Um, you know, taking the internet from 2D to 3D that has like defense applications or is being driven by that aspect? I wouldn't say that it's being driven by that aspect, but certainly the applications are self-evident. The UK government in particular uses a lot of real-time 3D simulations, primarily using the Unreal Engine, which comes from Epic Games, for training. I'm sure parts of the US Army and US government does as well. But that's a key training exercise. And of course, we have the US Army's $22 billion contract. Again, it seems to be a little bit up in the air with Microsoft, which is for an end-to-end -end suite of augmented reality hardware, the HoloLens, plus custom software, plus Azure computing, plus the design of simulation to improve training. And that application makes sense. Call of Duty is clearly good at some things that it does. And the idea to make that a more realistic training simulation is self-evident in field medical practice as well. Last fall, Johns Hopkins performed its first ever live patient surgery, spinal surgery, on using an XR device. The head of the neuroscience department who performed that surgery said it was like driving a car with GPS the first time. Just as a sidebar, I wanna highlight why that analogy is important. We often think about the metaverse as a substitute. And we struggle to think, I don't want to live my life in the metaverse. I like the real life. Or let's focus there. But we don't drive GPS instead of a car. We drive a car with GPS. It's a complement, not a substitute. And so certainly we're seeing lots and lots of militaries around the world trying to say, how can we use this to train better or to simulate warfare better, an entry plan? These applications are ready now. The Hong Kong International Airport runs using a metaverse-styled simulation so that they can make better decisions about which gate, which tarmac, which runway do we use, when, where, and why. If there's a backup or a fire or, heaven forbid, a terrorist uh, event, what do we do then? And we can simulate this today. You know, I want to, I want, I want to push a bit on the complement rather than replacement aspect. Um, you joked about this in a, in a different podcast appearance you made, but it's easy to come off as a, a boomer when you make this point. But, you know, I'm, I'm 30, so I'm a little outside of the Gen Z. Like, I, I don't play Fortnite. You know, I'm aware of it, but I'm just like a little outside of it. Like, my formative video gaming experiences are on the Xbox 360 and like the PlayStation 3, right? So, like, that's placing myself in the time spectrum. 
I think a lot of folks my age and above see younger siblings, et cetera, spending all of their time in their rooms, disengaged from the real world. And I have a hard time saying, wait, how is the metaverse, especially when taken to the conclusion that your book could take it to, not going to just lead to a replacement of that real world engagement and then, and then have all of the attendant issues, AKA a lot of us don't experience younger people treating their current video games as GPS systems. Mm -hmm. No, it's the entire car. So how do you think about that dynamic? So I love this question. And a personal point of frustration is when I see headlines talking about video game addiction or isolating ourselves from the real world. And that's not because I don't fear those same elements. Screen time is something that I observe that I think is incredibly important for young people and infants in particular. Severe issues worth monitoring. I get frustrated because I find the concern inconsistent. There are 300 million Americans who watch television. The average American watches five and a half hours of television per day. I'm not talking about video at large. This excludes TikTok and YouTube or Snapchat. Five and a half hours per day. The average senior, by the way, watches close to eight hours per day. Nearly three quarters of that time is done solitary, alone. It's mostly on your couch. The TV industry uses the term lean back entertainment as though disengagement is a positive thing. Mm -hmm. If we're talking about the primary use of human leisure, there's three uses of time, work, leisure, necessity, necessity, sleeping, going to the restroom, eating. The average American is up for 14.4 hours per day. Of that, five and a half hours is television. Of course, most of the rest is work and necessity. We are a TV species. By definition, if we're going to find two to three hours to spend in the metaverse or in an interactive environment, it actually has to come from games or from television, or it has to be part of work where it is a complement. Again, that's not to say that spending five and a half hours per day playing a game isn't a concern. It may be, but we shouldn't think of it as a new behavior so much as shifting current behavior. I think one of the reasons why we consider video gaming addiction more severe than television is because the concentration of that time is much higher. When the average American watches 150 hours per month of television, that's spanning dozens and dozens of programs. Whereas when they're playing a video game, that 100 hours might be split across one or two titles. That seems a lot more fearful. But again, it's also a more social medium. Your brain is demonstrably more engaged and you're often co-experiencing it with others. At minimum, I think that that's a positive shift from solitary time, disengaged on the couch to leaning forward, hanging out with friends with agency. But again, there are other concerns. I don't think, however, we're gonna stop going to Iceland, stop going to a bar or baseball game because games are better. I think we'll stop watching television. And for those for whom Iceland is not an option, I think it's great. I don't think most of us hope to retire to become the median American watching eight hours of television per day. I think we do that because we don't have many other opportunities. We're differently able, we're sick and so forth. That's really interesting. This takes us a little further in the script, but I wanna, this is the perfect time to do it. Um, the Chinese Communist Party very clearly disagrees with your articulation of this. Um, so I'd love for you to introduce it, but on a baseline level, there already are like limitations um, on like video gaming specifically for minors in China. Can you just reflect on that basic approach? Because when we put it this way, obviously there's all sorts of like Western disagreements regarding um, how the Chinese Communist Party has approached these sort of questions. But I've actually noticed just anecdotally and just in the zeitgeist, a lot of sympathy towards that very direct top-down approach from folks who would disagree with basically every other thing that's happening in China, I see this sense of despair of, well, look, this just looks so bad. And maybe you do just need to have so aggressive a response in this specific context. So can you just respond to the move there? Sure. So let me say two things, one of which is, I think, going to sound more alarmist than I intended to be. There's this perspective that alcohol is an incredibly pernicious substance, right? And that were it invented today, we would never legalize it. And many argue that marijuana is the reverse. Socially considered unacceptable, even though we find that the harms it produces are fairly modest. 
So that's why we see liberation of one over time and more controls on the other in general. The problem is, of course, alcohol has been around for thousands of years in the mainstream, hard, hard as we've tried to cramp down on it. Gaming has been underestimated for its social potency for quite some time. It was frill, it was niche behavior. And so it has kind of snuck up on us, and that sounds pejorative, but I mean, it wasn't on our radar as mass media of extreme importance. But in China, gaming really only emerged over the last 10 or 12 years, much mm -hmm. like most of Asia. And so it was a lot more acute. It was like discovering a new form of media instantly, and then it proliferated rapidly. Why? Because over the last 15 years, China also rapidly digitized, rapidly went to mobile, and almost all of their society transformed around digital products like WeChat, which comes from Tencent. And in the West, think of WhatsApp and Facebook as though it were also PayPal, Visa, and iOS, mm -hmm. extraordinarily important. And so we had this rapid proliferation of a new medium in the digital economy that was running the physical economy in a market where Sarft and others were extremely controlled about who could access content, who could distribute content, and what was the implications of that. And so I think China more than any other market, but we see similarities in India, which has banned a number of popular games, that this is an incredibly important channel for communication. Much like we recognize that the significance of the press, of cable news, of TV distribution, far exceeds actually its profits, right? Berlusconi, a good example of that. Rupert Murdoch, a good example. And so I wouldn't say that China necessarily has a fundamental perspective here. I just think it happened more acutely within a framework of greater mindfulness of media. And then that's exacerbated by the fact that games are not unicast, they're not broadcast. It's not a network to you where everything that happens is centrally managed. It is decentralized, not technically, but every single match is a different virtual space of relatively unmonitored congregation that a company is operating, right? Mm -hmm. A television network doesn't operate a virtual space. It pushes out static pre-recorded content. This is operating a parallel plane. It also happens to be incredibly hard to monitor, text, audio, easy to monitor. But if I wanted to put coding on multiple dimensions that if you go to the right angle, now you can see the message, really, really hard. So I think China is just generally cognizant. This is potent. It's new. We need to manage it. It's hard to manage and are taking a very different approach that really isn't possible elsewhere. You know, what's so helpful, two things in response to that. One, what's helpful about the way you just articulated that last part is that if we purely as Westerners look at the Chinese regulations as about screen time and making sure our young people could engage with science and technology properly, we're going to miss half of the picture because a huge portion of it, once again, to your point, is about societal control, regulated spaces, yes or no. So that's, that's, just, that's just a helpful way to think about this. And two, just a funny thought I just had, to your point around the perception of gaming changing and niches, I, whenever I scroll through Instagram, I keep noticing, man, like all these gamers are like pretty attractive. Right. You're just seeing like attractive, like fit, engaged people playing video games, engaging. And that goes against, once again, those like niche cultural stereotypes, 80s, 90s, like early 2000s, and speaks to the fact that the, the spaces and the stereotypes about who does this behavior is, is going to change a bit. Um, another question I, I want to ask related to this is you, you um, write about this idea of there being a, a metaverse, one metaverse, not metaverses. Um, you know, you specifically say, like, we don't say the internet or an internet. I get that rhetorically, but I'm curious, speaking of China, it seems to be the key difference between the 90s and today is that you no longer have this broad global internet that's seen as this democratizing force that breeds cooperation and openness, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You have a Russian version of the internet as of basically um, February. You have a Chinese version. It's very closely tied to that Russian version. There's an EU version and there's an American version. Speak about this idea of 
they're necessarily maybe like, so metaphorically, I get using the word metaverse, but it just seems to me that given everything we're describing, there really would be five different metaverses in the way there are five different internets now, but there yeah. weren't actually five different internets up until basically, let's say, when Google and Yahoo, et cetera, were banned from China in the mid 2000s. This is a great question. And I want to start by hitting on something you just teed up because it's a good way to talk about this evolution. It's my belief that one of the fundamental problems with, say, Hollywood's ability to accommodate and prepare for disruption from gaming, especially with younger demographics, the fact that so few of the largest companies on earth were prepared for the ascendance of gaming technically, and the skepticism among regulators as to its importance relates to their time and exposure to game. For example, most Hollywood executives at the top level are 50 to 65. What does that mean? The last time they really experienced video gaming was when their kids were still in their early teens with a PlayStation 2 or PlayStation 3. The challenge with that problem, we're now at the PlayStation 5, is gaming is the only entertainment and leisure category that rides Moore's Law. If you take a look at Iron Man 2008 and compare it to Thor 4, which comes out today, you could see elevation in visual effects in cohesive narrative world building and others, but it's largely the same art form. You go back to 1977 Superman, it's still mostly the same thing. But gaming in a few years changes really dramatically. Mm -hmm. And that's because it is exposed to Moore's Law. And so we see fundamental changes in experience, in how many people participate, in the emergent behaviors, the economic significance. And so if you're disengaged, and I'm telling you this quite sincerely, if your last exposure was even five years ago, or it's occasional incidental watching Roblox or Fortnite, you're fundamentally going to misunderstand that evolution. Now, to talk about why we're seeing different internets is connected. You're right, we had a universal internet, but why do we have emerging regional internets? Well, that's because while the internet doesn't really exist, right, it's a protocol stack that we all opt into, like English doesn't, to the extent it does exist, it's cables in the ground. And cables in the ground are privately owned or publicly owned infrastructure, which are fundamentally operated by the government. And so over time, as the importance of the internet has grown, so too has regional differences exacerbated by regulatory differences, but also stronger local players. And that's almost a requirement for the regulations to come up, right? Mm -hmm. If you have no domestic market, you do want to cultivate it, but you also need your economy to compete nationally. We have seen over the past 10 years, growth in really three or four different categories regionally in the African continent, Southeast Asia, China, and Europe. And those are typically businesses of deep local ties, ride sharing, insurance, banking and payments, and e-commerce. Why? Because those all kind of require local connective tissue. It's just hard for Amazon to be strong in India or Google to offer payment services in Europe or Africa to the same way they can in North America. And so we have those three effects, increasing importance of the digital economy, increasing regulatory scrutiny as a result of that, mixed with growth in the local tech sector. The metaverse, if one believes it, means an ever-growing share of our time, labor, leisure, life, existence, wealth, spend, happiness will be in virtual spaces and digital spaces. That means that the first two things I mentioned are very likely. The digital significance towards the economy will grow, the regulatory scrutiny, especially when it comes to where the citizens' data is stored within national bounds or not, when, where, and why will grow. And the relevance of local market participants will grow. Google and Salesforce, pretty good at B2B services and functional utilities, not good at deep cultural products. Mm -hmm. And so I fundamentally believe that we will see much, much greater regional differences in the years to come. We talked about China being mindful we talk about the EU starting to open things up. South Korea is a really interesting example. The Ministry of ICT has formed the South Korean Metaverse Alliance. It's effectively an obligatory organization spanning over 450 companies from LG to Hyundai to 
fridge manufacturers and banking institutions. And their perspective is not control. It is an awareness of the importance of interoperability and standards, a recognition of how important that is for every company, and a recognition of the fact that the West is likely to struggle to establish them. Mm. And so they're saying, let's force everyone effectively, nationally, to collaborate. Then that might be to the detriment of the individual player. And note that South Korean tech companies are extraordinarily successful domestically. Their digital economy is extraordinarily developed but they don't really play well elsewhere. They're actually very local. And so the government is saying, let's foster rich, rich interoperability locally to the detriment of the individual player, but to the collective benefit domestically and abroad. And so their bet is, yes, the metaverse in South Korea is gonna be very different, not just in tech, not just in providers, not just in quasi regulations, but in function. And they seem to believe that if they can build stronger ties between their diverse economy, that they will be able to rapidly proliferate in the rest of the world in the way in which Silicon Valley has done over the past four years. What's interesting here is we're nearing our last section here. I want to hit a couple, I'm not going to hit all of the points I want to hit, but this, this book is really good. So seriously, people um, check it out. Um, what would you say, why should just a non-technical person why should a non-investor be excited about the metaverse? Because the one quick thing I'll add here is that I'm sure you've heard this cliche, COVID forced the world 10 years into the future. And I think a lot of folks, myself included, experienced the COVID version of like increasing metaverse. We watch Mark Zuckerberg have his avatar try on, you know, skinny jeans, other things. And we basically say, okay, this isn't really that great or I'm not that particularly excited about it. So like, I know this is an ersatz version of the, of the metaverse. So I don't want to basically say, mm-hmm. if, you, if you like Mark Zuckerberg, then you're going to love this. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to put it that way, but what's your response to people who are just going to be more skeptical of this after they went through Zoom hell for two years and also don't want to sit in a virtual avatar with their boss, in an avatar meeting with their boss? Yeah, I mean, look, first and foremost, most of the design principles that we have at a new technological era tend to be wrong and deprecated very quickly. If you remember the early applications on even the iPhone, a relatively mature product, the calendar app had stitching. The game center was a blackjack green felt table. The notes app was yellow paper with red lines. We start by trying to simulate exactly what we already know with new capabilities. And it turns out it serves no utility. I deeply don't believe in 3D conference rooms. I also really don't believe in virtual real estate where you spend tens of thousands of dollars to have a parcel of land in a place with no marginal cost and no practical utility to adjacency. Yeah, we care about domain names. Google is a good domain name, but no one's like, what's the domain beside Google, right? Mm -hmm. It's, It's not a useful thing, least of all paying for it. And so I think that there are things that we are trying to replicate first in the real world that actually very few people believe in, even if they get a lot of mind share and press. But the more important thing that I wanna say is, there are a lot of problems over the past 15 years that we've encountered in these social mobile cloud era, platform power, regulation, data rights, data literacy, data security, mis and disinformation, radicalization, the role of algorithms, toxicity, abuse, and harassment. Many of those are going to get harder in the future because more society is going to move online and 3D is just harder in almost all forms. Mm -hmm. Radicalization was challenging with ISIS in 2D social. Imagine what it looks like in a 3D simulated environment where you can be trained as the U.S. Army hopes to, but without ever needing to get a passport stamped in or out. These problems are severe. And yet at the same time, intracycle changes are hard. None of us are going to change operating systems. None of us can really affect the technology programs that are already being deployed. Regulations trying really hard and important. But between cycles, when we change cycle from PC to mobile, we see extraordinary change. This is why we have 100 billion plus being invested. This is why all of these companies are rushing to a future that most of them admit is far away. But what that means is we, users, consumers, voters, developers, regulators have an opportunity to affect 
the nature of the future in a way that only appears every 15 to 20 years. This is why I wrote my book. It was an encapsulation for the mainstream audience of something that I deeply believe that is going to come, that the tech titans are manifesting, but we need to be prepared for. And so just being excited about the ability to say, I don't like how things are, and we can change who leads and how, that's inspiring to me. And I actually wanted to talk about this earlier, but I think it's important to really hit it put in really concrete terms what you mean by this step change in technological era. And this is also the thing which, once again, speaking to my anonymous uh, Hill staffer friend who's also a listener, so this is a very fan service effectively. But the story I think you're, I hope you're about to tell is illustrating this isn't just like a cynical play. This is what they believe. Talk about what happened when Microsoft and when Microsoft misunderstood, when Microsoft and Facebook respectively misunderstood the implications of the transition to mobile from desktop? So every time we have a platform shift, the powers that be always look best positioned because they are. They have the most cash, the most users, the most resources, often the most conviction, certainly the most momentum, often a first mover advantage. There was no model that said IBM would be irrelevant in personal computing devices in the late 1990s or early 2000s. When you take a look at Microsoft in 2003, they had 96% market share in personal computing devices. They had the most popular browser in the world. In 1995, Microsoft released the Internet Tidal Wave Memo, reiterated in 1998. By the time the iPhone came out, they had tens of millions of mobile devices, almost all of the mobile device revenue. You can't not look at that company and say they're going to be the primary beneficiary. And yet the future is really hard to predict. We can do platitudes, and I do my best in the book not to get too prescriptive, about what you could have been right about in 1995 about the future. More people online, more often for more devices, for more reasons to greater economic effect. But the smartest minds on earth couldn't predict exactly what that meant. And that's why Microsoft was pushed out of browsers, pushed out of most mobile services, why they don't even have a mobile operating system, why their market share in computing devices is now less than 5%, a full inversion. And mobile is a good example of that. 2007, January, you can find Steve Ballmer after the introduction of the iPhone laughing. He says it may do very well, but he thinks everything about it is wrong. The price point, 500 is too high. They believe in 200. The keyboard, touch screens matter, but you need a keyboard. It's going to be business-led, not consumer-led, as Steve Jobs thinks. The primary business model is going to be operating system licensing, not app stores and hardware. And he believes that the mobile phone is going to be the secondary computing device, not the primary device. They had all the cash, all the resources, all the momentum, all the engineers, the first mover advantage. Too many theses were wrong. Product doesn't exist anymore. They spent more than a decade horizontal on a stock price until Satya Nadella came in and reconstituted the theory. Mark is another good example. Facebook is often considered the best case study for a pivot to mobile, right? Facebook predated the mobile era, but we forget how close they were to losing. In 2008, the App Store comes out. In 2009, we have the campaign, there's an app for that. In 2010, Sesame Street parodies that app campaign. And yet it's not until 2012 that Facebook comes out with their first native application. Now that's a technical term, but what it means is the app is written for the device. Before that, we had what was called a thin client. It's basically a tiny bit of code so that you download an icon, but then you load what is effectively a web browser. We know today that browser-based experiences are inferior to apps. This is why the App Store regulation against Apple is important. They say the app store is closed, but the web is open. Well, the web can't do nearly what an application can do. And Apple also governs what the browser can do. But so the point is, Mark believed in HTML5, partly out of a belief of openness. And the result was less than 3% of revenue in the first quarter of 2012 was mobile. In July, Mark announced they had rewritten the entirety of the app for native code. Again, this is four years after the App Store. Within one month, they doubled time in the app. Within three quarters, revenue surged from three to 24%. That's why we think of the pivot to mobile. 
the speed of the shift without recognizing it was a failure for four years with pent up demand. He called it in 2012, in a comment that seems quaint today, the biggest strategic mistake in the company's eight year history. But the repercussions continue. In, what's, in 2009, WhatsApp was founded. At the time, Facebook had 350 million monthly active users, WhatsApp had zero. By the time they bought the company in 2014, WhatsApp had more users on mobile than Facebook did. Why? Because it was a native app for mobile messaging. Instagram founded a year later native image sharing on a mobile device. They bought that company. Without those two acquisitions, it seems unlikely that Facebook would be near what it is today. They almost missed it because of fundamental tech bets. We may see that Oculus, which notably acquired one year after Instagram for twice the fee, is similar. And yet if there's anything that we see from a regulatory perspective, it's that often acquisitions were key to catching up. Microsoft didn't acquire a mobile provider, but Android was built off an acquisition that Google made. Facebook pivoted to mobile through M&A primarily, and potentially pivots to the metaverse through the foundations of M&A. If that isn't available right now, there's unprecedented opportunity here. And that's a big challenge. As we look at the metaverse, it's hard to discount, Mark. Again, multi-year head start, billions of daily active users, tens of billions of operating cash flow, a founder in control and as convicted as anyone can imagine. But we've been here before. Those things are not enough. You need embrace from the community, from developers, and your theses have to be right. So in the last uh, two to three questions that are coming to mind for folks, so I, I really embrace and enjoy your rhetoric around, this is an opportunity to reimagine the internet. And when you articulate things that way, you sound a lot like a person who is in the Web3 space. Now, Web3 and the metaverse are, are different concepts. They share similarities, there are bits that are <laughs> interoperable, obviously, but can you speak to, you know, what is the main difference between these two ideas? I loved, by the way, the um, electrification in 19th century versus the spread of democracy um, in Republican forms of government um, metaphor. So can you explain that? Sure. So Web3 and the metaverse are often conflated, and there are good reasons for that and bad reasons for that. Web3, by definition, succeeds Web2, the era that we largely observe ourselves being in. And that's not a Web3 description. We've talked about Web2.0, the social internet, for quite some time. The metaverse is also positioned as a successor to today's internet. Two things that succeed the current thing naturally become intertwined. In addition, many believe that the principles, at minimum, for Web3, decentralization, more power to the individual through rights and data custody, more profits to the developer as opposed to the aggregator platforms are essential to having a thriving metaverse, much like we would say that those attributes are essential to having a thriving US economy. We're glad that big though big tech is, they're less than one and a half percent of the global economy in revenue, less than 10% of the digital economy. And we still find that fearful. But so the belief that Web3 needs to push more power to the user, more power to the individual developer, not the super platforms, we can see how that would be necessary for the metaverse. But we are describing different things. Mm -hmm. We are describing in one instance, a decentralized internet, technically speaking, primarily around decentralized networks of servers and data storage. That's separate. It may be part of technologically, but separate from the metaverse where we talk about a network of interconnected, real-time rendered 3D virtual worlds. The example that you've teed up is, I like to talk about industrialization or electrification, largely coincided with the spread of Republican democ uh, republics and democracy at large, but they're separate. We can see how they're intertwined. Tech change tends to bring about societal change. Societal change tends to be coincident with technological change. And we can understand how electrification and industrialization aided the democratic process in much the same way a presidential candidate used to see very few people travel very limited during a national election and individual voices were hard to share whereas now technology and the internet have given more to the individual voice, but they are separate. 
and separate for good reasons. Yeah, the good way to think about it is Tsarist Russia also had electricity. So there's, there are alternate yes. means of organizing these sort of questions and confusing them is not going to be particularly helpful. So, okay, so last last two. Um, you know, I, I was born in 1992, so I'm just, I'm just um, basically young enough to remember Windows 95. And what I remember, information superhighway, um, surfing the web, like all these metaphors and all these descriptors that have been left in the mid 1990s. Do you, th- do you see any, any just equivalent concepts that you think are, we're going to look back and be like, man, that was kind of like, not really it. Totally. Now you'll find that this is another area where we find some similarity in talking points with the web three movement, right? They talk about the fact that the internet underestimated that it seems like a toy didn't have utility and to the extent it did, it didn't reach the degree in which many hoped. The challenge here is we see the exact same version in the metaverse. And I would argue a lot more closely. Why did we say the World Wide Web or the information superhighway? Why did we talk about surfing the internet? You surf the internet on your keyboard. You used a mouse because it looked like one. We were incredibly stuck in these skeuomorphic, often Mm leisure-oriented descriptions of the future. And of course, that provided almost no helpful insight into what the internet would look like, certainly not the most valuable companies on earth. And we face that with the metaverse. Right now, we characterize it as Ready Player One. We think of students jumping through a virtual lobby dressed like Thor fighting Hulk in a simulacra boardroom. And that's not very useful. You'll find that most people who are advocating for this future do not believe that that's the primary use case, believe that almost all of the value sits beyond that. We're talking about a global scale simulation that is accessible to essentially everyone like the internet is. And the way that I would want to cap that off is by pointing out the world's greatest development platform is the world itself. And yet it's very hard to build into. It's almost all done in isolation. The importance of the business next to you is incredibly high. And yet you have no insight into it. A government, a local permit provider has almost no visibility into the coordinated efforts of, or uncoordinated efforts that build a semi-coordinated society. And so these, this is where we get into digital twins about a virtual persistent enterprise and global infrastructure simulation becomes really interesting. And I'll tell you one of my favorite examples that separates that fiction, the Hulk and Captain America example, comes from a project that happened in Tampa, the Water Street development. I write about this a little bit in my book. It's a multi-billion dollar, multi-building, multi-year development and revitalization program. And they decided, actually, let's use a simulation to facilitate this. They built an 11 foot diameter model, 3D printed, supported by a dozen projection cameras, but then rendered using a real-time simulation engine. Why? So that you could actually see if that building is 11 stories or 14 stories, how does it affect congestion in the city? If we put the car park on the north, not south entrance, how does that affect congestion? How does that affect emergency response times? If we build three buildings of the following heights, how does that impact the local park, the light that it receives, the heat based on the materials? Specifically on July 22nd at 7 p.m., how does the light affect everything? You start to think about this, building 3D simulations to support engineering and then start to grow it out into live operated simulations, where now the city gets to make decisions on where do we permit to drive collective success in real time? What information do we know that today is asynchronous? It's stored in a file cabinet for silo decision-making, that permit, this permit, 12 stories, 11 stories, but look at it as an ecosystem, like society. These are the actual applications that most are running to, that most when you see an estimate, McKinsey says 5 trillion for the metaverse by the end of the decade, KPMG and Goldman Sachs 13 trillion, Uh, Morgan Stanley Citibank put it at the 8 trillion. That's where they see the value there. We cannot get held up by these consumer applications, which incredibly important, societally needle moving, are actually small. Facebook, incredibly successful, 
but its revenues are around 100 billion. The UN estimates that the global digital economy is nearly $20 trillion per year, 20% of world GDP. And of course, most of the remaining 80% is digitally powered or augmented. Mm -hmm. During the uh, war in Ukraine, a lot of attention has been spent on Planet Labs, which takes incredible images of the entire world across multiple different spectra bands, from infrared for biomass to just visuals. Those are being used now to produce an every 12 hour virtual reproduction of the entire world and its information for optimization and coordination. That is how we should think about the metaverse if we're gonna be fine tuned about it, not Ready Player One. Quick last 30 second question here. Like you said, the 80s and the 90s offer us an optimistic view of regulation, attention, energy. People could joke about Al Gore's um, misquotation on inventing the internet, but he was like an active, engaged legislator yeah. who had who had actually, I, I joked about, I did an episode of, about Al Gore recently. I joked he should have been a VC. He probably would have been pretty good at it. Um, but basically there were engaged legislators. Like what's just your general advice for, for folks who should be engaging in this space now? Because once again, if you're working on these, in these working groups in 1980, Windows 95 is 15 years away. Yeah. Ideally, you would have folks like my skeptical friend in the Hill thinking about 2035 now. I definitely don't see that happening. At right now, it's not, yeah. that is not a description of the status quo. The frontiers for the metaverse are being fought on proprietary APIs and limitations, primarily from the hardware providers. If you take a look at what's at the core, you can see I'm, I'm gonna run beyond your 30 seconds. Yeah. Right now, almost everything we use a digital device for relates to the physical economy. But almost everything is going into 3D real-time experiences. And that pushes our economy into the hardware operators that run payment process, permission, and provide digital passports to that environment. That means everyone is running into issues like what identity is forced upon us? What billing solution is provided? There's a trillion dollar in commerce that happens through the iPhone, but only 70 billion is actually paid by or through the app store. All of it's going there. And that means that the two platforms which manage it, again, authenticate it, gatekeep the technologies, require distribution and monitoring and payment services, are effectively what the government is today. They're the police, they're the customs authority, they're the banking and regulation system, they're the uh, FTC, FCC. And so that is of critical importance. If we want to think about how to build the most successful thriving metaverse economy or frankly physical world economy, we have to think about what these platforms have the right to legislate and what they don't. You'll actually find that many of the pioneers in the metaverse, Epic Games, I talk about their legal approach, are actually in their efforts to be responsible stewards, relinquishing control over things they have all the right to control to legislative processes. Epic, for example, has said that, that if they have a dispute with one of their licensees, a court injunction will be required for them to lock them out. That's commensurate with their belief that the metaverse requires the rights that a physical world tenant or landlord requires. Can't show up and lock them out, can't torch and delete all of their information, the government has to decide what their rights are, when and why, and what appropriate remediation looks like. And so that's my advocacy to regulators and government officials today. Sorry, do you have time for one more question? Uh, yeah, sure. Let's hit it. Yeah, great. Um, and by the way, when I said uh, 30 seconds, I was being respectful of your time. Oh, um, not yet. Well, no, as, like, as you know, I'm incapable of a short answer. So. Yeah, yeah, you know. So yeah, so that was, that was not a neg about <laughs> your answering ability. But no, this comes to mind. Um, IP, Let's close here, because this is also the definition of something that very much is up for grabs right now. So listeners likely know that there's a bit of a debate around Disney's license, like, you know, ownership of, of, of uh, Mickey Mouse. Um, Winnie the Pooh recently um, just became open. Um, you made a reference in another um, episode that you recorded to the fact that the minions and like Illumination is like, that's like a very valuable bit of IP. And let's just say if I'm a big company right now, I definitely think the minions are worth a lot more than Buzz Lightyear is when it comes to like ownership there. So if we're thinking about these like virtual worlds and like IP being so central to it, 
I don't want to overuse the, you know, digital theme park metaphor here, but how do you think our debates around IP from a corporate perspective are going to be reimagined when that seems to be such a key issue in this space? It's a, it's a great question. Look, we have only ever learned that we underestimate the value of IP. And as we have more different forums, mediums to express it, that value grows. If you take a look at the most generative or revenue generative seasons in Fortnite, they are the Marvel season, the Star Wars season. It's a Travis Scott season. It's FIFA and the NFL. If we're talking about another plane of existence where we want to live and self-express and enjoy, it stands to reason we're going to want to do that with the stories that we love most, and most of the returns will go to them. And this gets to one of the fundamental questions about centralization versus decentralization. We should not think about this as a war. Neither side can win. It's a question of degrees, where we sit on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. The challenge that we have made about the past 15 years is, and this is going to get technical, but it gets to my aforementioned question of regulation and what should and should not be owned, is that the internet protocol suite is what we call a thin protocol. We have IP addresses there, the Internet Engineering Task Force manages ICANN, web addresses, and more. But most of the intelligence and the value sits at the application layer. That's where your data is stored, your content, your social graph, your user account. And the enormity of that, we call it a fat application and a thin protocol, gives enormous feedback loops. The Web3 movement, where I absolutely agree with them, says that the primary failing of the Internet Protocol Suite is it should have been fatter. If you put into the Internet Protocol Suite your identity, right? if your IP address was actually login information that didn't sit within Facebook or within Google, if the data was stored publicly as a public good, let's put aside some of the discretion around who can access it, they would say that that would force greater competition at the application layer, less lock-in at the application layer. Mm -hmm. That's a valid argument, one I really believe. And it's where you get into these other questions of the iOS stack is incredibly thin, right? You can't use it without saying, you're my identity, you're my passport, you're my software management system, you're my privacy requirements and so forth. But the reason why I talk about IP is you can have the fattest possible protocol stack the thinnest possible application, but that does not preclude centralization. It does not preclude positive feedback loops to scale. And there are a bunch of reasons for that. Revenue begets greater investment leads to better product. Better product is itself defensible. Google and Bing are equally available, but we don't ever think to try one. And that's because habit also centralizes. We may actually find out that Bing is better, but our habit locks us into Google. But then you have brand, IP, and trust. OpenSea is the largest NFT marketplace, nearly 75 to 80% share. It charges more. It is a thin application, but of course, their brand and the habit leads us there. The fact that they're now getting into verification services to authenticate an NFT as authentic and not fraudulent also drives centralization to them and market power. But then intellectual property is that last one. We can have as decentralized a system, but at the end of the day, if Disney owns their IP and Disney places it in forum A versus forum B, it doesn't require centralization or decentralization of the full stack. Functionally, I want to go see Iron Man. And that itself is incredibly potent. And so we should expect that as we embrace the metaverse as a new immersive forum, our attachment to the stories and characters that we love will only grow. And that's going to become an increasingly potent element of the future at large. Well said. Matthew, this has been, this has been excellent. This has been very helpful. Um, and I hope all my skeptical listeners have had their questions assuaged at least a bit. Thank you so much for joining us on The Realignment. Thank you. And, and I have to say, for the skeptics out there, look, one of the challenges here is if asked the same questions, and this seems like a little bit of a hedge, but I believe it sincerely. I believe that the metaverse is a next generation internet, an evolved era for computing and networking at large. There's no 30 minute nor 60 minute conversation we could have had in 1995 that would have assuaged all concerns, but provided a comprehensive understanding of that topic. There's actually a fundamental tension between the enormity of 
what's to come that I believe and the ability to communicate it quickly. And so with that, I'll do the plug for my book, The Metaverse and How It Will Revolutionize Everything. And I say that because the purpose of the book was to explain in extraordinary detail every technical requirement, the fights that will occur over those technical requirements between which parties and over which premises, all for the sake of advocating for a better version of the future than we might otherwise reach and certainly versus today. But thanks for your time.